Yeah, we first lived on 97th, in, at 97th Street, right between Broadway and, and West End. And there was all these great movie theaters there, the Thalia movie theater, where you see, uh, see foreign films. This is, you know, late, early 60s. Mm -hmm. You can see uh, Ingmar Bergman films and Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton and all that stuff. Um, yeah, it was a good neighborhood. Then we moved to a very, uh, actually, a, a historic building on, on uh, Central Park West. 101st Street, Central Park West, and in that building um, lived uh, Max Roach, Abby Lincoln, Art Blakey, Elvin Jones, Rasan Roland Kirk. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, and and little punk ass Bobby <laughs> Moses was in there trying to learn how to play some drums, you know, trying to be being around that. And the people I'd see in the elevator, man, you know, see Eric Dolphy in the elevator, Booker Little he used to come oh, wow. up there. Yeah. I saw him play with Max's group, um, another great trumpet player. And, yeah. Uh, um, oh, yeah, man, Julian Priester, Clifford Jordan, Jimmy Garrison, Lee Morgan. I see all these people just in the elevator. You sure, know, yeah. Uh, going to one place or another. And Rasan, actually, um, my parents, he was like another, he was kind of like another father to me, uh, you know. Uh, um, my parents signed the lease for him because... Um, the landlord looked at him and said, is this guy going to pay the rent? Because he looked like he's from outer space, Rasan. <laughs> he's wearing all this weird leather and all these, uh, you know, sirens and shit hanging off of him. Right, and sure. And, uh, and my parents said, oh, no, he's a successful musician. He's, he'll, he'll, you know, and so we vouched for him, signed the lease for him. Wow. And I spent more time at, in his house than my own house. Is Mingus, that right? Mingus, oh, yeah, I, was there. I spent all, all day with him there. And and t used to go out with him too and help him. Um, he, in those days, we had record stores, right? It's a kind of thing of the past, right? Sure, and, right. And uh, I would go with him into Sam Goody's was the big one, that, uh, and at that time in New York, huge place, you know, uh, with albums. And he would make me read the liner notes to all these albums. Uh, you know, I became a speed reader. I was, uh, you know, after that. And I remember saying to him, he wasn't Rasan then, he was just Roland. I said, Ro, why, you know, why do you need to write, to hear what all these white critics writing about the music, you know? And I just tell you who's on it, you know, the name of the record. Yeah. He wanted to hear everything. He was, he just wanted to know everything, wanted to hear everything. So I, got, I was reading all the liner notes. There was another place where I went to high school and, and, and Rasan came and played with our high school band. That was amazing, man, you know. Some of the, I, I'm still in touch with one of them guys named Joel Peskin. He's a saxophone player. He lives in L.A. Hmm. Um, but he was. We went to the same high school together, and we played. Rasan came over one time. But there was a record store near there, called the Jazz Record Center, and records were two dollars, and they'd play them for you. Oh, really? You could go in and listen to them. And that was two blocks when we went to high school. I hated school, and I usually didn't go. I used to cut school almost every day. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I used to walk the whole island because I had to pretend for my father that I was gone from like eight in the morning till four thirty, and uh, but I almost never went. You know, I really hated it, and uh, um, so I. But I spent at least spent a few hours a day in that record store where they play everything, and they had uh, uh, their motto was from bunk to monk. Um, and in those, day, in those days, Monk was avant-garde. That's uh -huh. like the, the, modern, the most modern stuff. And Monk Johnson was early Dixieland. So they had all kind of stuff, including old blues. I, you know, I, I started hearing people like Big Bill Brunzi and, you know, Muddy Waters and all these Mississippi John Hurt and all this great music. And they'd play it for you. Mm. So I, and for two bucks each, I'd, I'd buy pretty much a record a day. Uh, I used to have thousands. I got rid of most of them. I'm down to about, like, the last 70 albums that I'm keeping, and even though I'm thinking of letting them go, because I hardly listen anymore. Sure. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, that was a good time. Uh, uh, when, you know, when I lived on my own, when I left my parents, uh, had a, I lived on Eldridge Street in the Lower East Side, and that, was, and that building had Jim Pepper, Larry Coriel, Chris Hills, Mike Knock, Joanne Brackeen, Charles Brackeen, Arthur Harper, the bass player, just happened to live in the same building. Yeah. So you'd step out from the building, it's like Charles Ives, you hear five, <laughs> di five music coming from every, every, uh, yeah, that's where I first met Billy Hart, he came to Elger Street. And then I moved to, oh, that man, I'm listening, which came first, maybe the, before that, I think maybe the very first place was on the Bowery, 
which is, if you know New York, that's the funky part. It's still where a lot of bums and homeless people live. It's, it's, it, it's, it seems it, it's gone ungentrified, although I'm sure that the loft that I used to live in, would, the rent would be like ridiculously high. Oh, I bet. Imagine. Yeah. But in those days, my rent was $52 a month. <laughs> And I had a roommate, so my share was $26 a month. That's amazing. And I lived on brown rice. Every once in a while, I'd mix a can of tuna in there with the, and tamari, a little tamari. So uh, a lot of LSD. <laughs> and, uh, and all we did was get high, play music, and, and have sex with hippie girls, which was much easier in those days. It, it was much, much, you know, I think it's much easier than it is now, uh, as far as I know. But anyway, so it was good times, a good time to be there. And then going to hear music, you know, uh, I used to go to this club called Slugs. That's the place where Lee Morgan got shot. Oh, yeah. Which, by the way, there's a great documentary about, uh, mm. that w which features the woman who shot him, who is his ex-wife. Yeah. And she's very sympathetic, you know. She just, you know, it's tragic what she did. She really regrets it. Yeah. You know, right. but, he, but he wasn't acting right, you know, and she, she snapped and she took him out. Yeah. But I could have very easily seen that because I used to go there all the time. I go two or three nights a week, I go to club, the slugs. And, sure. You know, it's hard for people of this generation to imagine, but you could go there on a Tuesday night, no big deal, five bucks, and maybe you buy a beer or two over the course of the night. And you could see three or four sets. I think it went, they went till really late. And it's like a typical Tuesday night would be maybe, uh, say, Joe Henderson, Roy Haynes, Chick Corea, Eddie Gomez. That's and there'd be 30 people in the club, like no big deal. Yeah. The next, wow. next night, it might, I remember seeing Blue Mitchell and, and, and uh, Hank Mobley, uh, Bar uh, Cedar Walton, Sam Jones, Billy Higgins. Same thing, five bucks. It'd be 40 people in the club. That's amazing. Like no big deal. Middle of the week. And so, um, you know, that was, and, and then there was also different lofts that people used for music. Um, uh, Sam Rivers had a great place called Studio Rivby. Mm -hmm. It was on Rivington Street, very close to another place I lived on, Grand Street, off of the Bowery. Mm -hmm. um, Rivington Street, walking distance. That's the first place I heard Milford Graves play, which blew my head right off my neck when I heard that guy. I never heard drums play like that. Sure. Wow. A young, young Milford. I also remember hearing Cecil Taylor, Tony Williams duet at Ribby Studio. Oh, yeah, wow. And I have to say, young Tony playing free, man, I think actually that's the best I ever heard Cecil Taylor was with Tony Williams, young Tony. The drumming <laughs> was just so symphonic and, and subtle. Uh, Tony got older, he became more uh, macho, you know, uh, like hit hard all the time, fast, hard, you know. But in the early days, he had played with a lot of, uh, he had some of that, he would bang, but he, he had a, a, a subtle, you know, and it, uh, but also his speed, and just him and Cecil, is amazing. Yeah, I saw a lot of those people, uh, uh, Rashid Ali had a place called Ali's Alley, I saw a lot of music there, hmm. saw Rashid play many times. Um, slugs, I saw Albert Eiler. In fact, <laughs> the woman that, my first, well, own, first and only wife, um, um, we were going on a date to see Albert Eiler at Slugs, and we never made it. We wound up in bed for three days. But, you know, <laughs> about a year later, Fair we got trade. married. So, but we eventually did get to Slugs and hear Albert Eiler, you know. Wow.